Now, early on, Tony Spilatro and his brother, Michael Spilatro, you know, they were liked. They were respected. They had a lot of, a lot of good friends uh, in the Chicago outfit, family, friends, associates. The Spilatros and the Lombardos were very close. Both of their families came to the Grand Avenue patch from Bari, Italy. This is a great photo here. This is, I think, is at the Daily Center. You can see you got Tony Spilatro all dressed up. He probably had a cork hearing that day. And then right next to him, a lot bigger, you got Joe Lombardo. I love how he's got the cigar lit inside the uh, the court building. So it looks like they're signing some paperwork, but... Um, when asked about the Spalatro brothers' murders during the family secrets testimony, Joe Lombardo told Dr. Pat Spalatro that if he wasn't in the can, if he was on the streets, that would have never happened, meaning Joey would never have allowed the outfit guys to kill the Spalatro brothers, especially the way they did it, by brutally beating them to death. But Joey was wrong. The outfit bosses have had enough of Tony Spalatro's bullshit. They probably used Michael as the pawn to get the Tony, although they may have some interest in him as well. But God himself couldn't have saved Tony Spalatro. Joey Lombardo would have liked to think that he could have saved his good friend Tony, but uh, he would have been against, uh, he would have had to go up against uh, an army of guys like Ayupa, Ferriola, Carlisi, and others. Joey would have definitely been outmatched. As we talked about before, you know, when you, when you go away to jail, obviously Joey lost a lot of his power and he lost a lot of his men. Frankie Calabrese said that Joey was supposed to be shelved, put on the shelf, but he was sneaking around with his cousin, Joe the Builder. But Joey was way too smart. He just kept a low profile. He was definitely active, but he was trying to let the government and the media and the press know that his mob days were over. He wrote a letter uh, to the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, denouncing the Chicago outfit, saying he was no longer a part of it. If anybody mentions his name, please call the FBI. But unfortunately for Joey, uh, he got pinched in the 2005 uh, indictment, and they charged him and convicted him with uh, murdering Danny Seifert. But Tony Spilatro and Joey Lombardo were very good friends. They definitely did some work together. Tony Spilatro could have uh, been an accomplice when Joey did his first piece of work when they killed Manny Scar at the high-rise building on uh, Lakeshore Drive. But it had to be pretty hard for Joey to sit there in court and hear for the first time from Nick Calabrese how his good friends Michael and Tony Spilatro were, were brutally beat to death. So imagine seeing Joe Lombardo in court at 78 years old, listening to Nick Calabrese testify on Tony and Michael's death. Here's another great photo here. You got Rocco Lombardo and Michael Splatro just showing, you know, what good friends they were. Uh, poor Rocco Lombardo, you know, he lost his brother, lost some family members. He lost Tony and Michael. Uh, he was smart, though, didn't really get too close to the fire. But uh, here's Rocco Lombardo, Joey Lombardo's brother, good friend with uh, Tony Spilatro and Michael Spilatro. I remember when I lived on Grand and Noble, I used to get a lot of uh, parking tickets for one of the Spilatro brothers. I think it was Victor Spilatro. But I would get 30, 40 parking tickets, and I used to save them just because they had the last name Spilatro. But here's um, Michael Spilatro, the victim of the Chicago outfit, Joe Lombardo, or Rocky Lombardo, associate of Chicago outfit, 
two of the best friends. Now here you got uh, Dr. Pat Spilatro. And in this photo, he's aged a little bit. You can, he resembles Tony and Michael. But in court, when I seen him testify at the Family Secret Trial, he looked a lot like Tony Spilatro, but a lot bigger. And a lot of people on the streets will tell you he was actually the toughest of all the Spilatros. But he went legit. He became a pretty well-known dentist, kind of like a popular dentist, especially for all the mob guys, their family, their associates. But this man here, he was obsessed with his brother's death. He was going around to all the federal prisons, meeting with outfit guys and associates that he knew, and he knew a lot of them, asking them, who killed my brothers and why? Some of them had no idea. The ones that did know obviously wouldn't say anything. They would basically ghost him. Fast forward, he became an FBI informant. Nobody knew that. Joe Lombardo, when he was out on the lam, he was staying at his good friend Dominic Freck Calarco's house. He had a toothache. They went to see the doctor, dentist, Spilatro, at night when the place was closed. Nobody would see him. Pat Spilatro testified on the stand that he treated Joey's tooth. And then about a week later, the tooth relapsed. He had pain again. And we all know what it's like to have toothache. So Frex called, made a meeting with the spot with the dentist. Joey went to see him. And he asked Joey, who killed my brothers and why? And Joey told him the second time, Doc, when you're given an order, you follow that order or you go too. Well, the dentist didn't like that. When Frex and Joey Lombardo left, Frex called the FBI. He told them that Joe Lombardo is with Frex, Dominic Calerco, staying at his house. The cops pulled over the two old men at gunpoint, cuffed them up. Joey had about three, four, five thousand on him. They didn't charge Frex with um, aiding and abetting a fugitive like they could have, but he did have to testify that Joe Lombardo uh, asked him if he could live with him when he was on the lam. But Dr. Pat Spilatro was an informant. He's the man that testified against Joe Lombardo, even though his family and their family were very close. I did not like this man on the stand. He came across arrogant, cocky, and he had a vendetta. He definitely had an ax to grind. Um, you know, I respect the fact that he lost his brothers, but Tony Spilatro was no angel, and he knew exactly what his brother was involved in. Maybe not so much Michael, but he knew the life that Tony was involved in. He was friends with a lot of the mob guys, their families, and their associates. But shame on this man for testifying uh, against Joe Lombardo and ratting to the FBI that Joey was hiding out with Dominic Clarko. When they asked Joey about it, Joey Lombardo put his head down, and he sadly said, I did not know this man was a beefer. Here's a great photo here of young Tony Spilatro, I think it was a wedding day, a lot of his friends here. And in the back, you got Pauly Shiro. Pauly Shiro was a very close friend of Tony Spilatro. He acted as a sleeper out west, out in Arizona. He was one of the defendants at the Family Secrets trial, one of the older defendants. And basically, he was the lookout when they killed Emo Vachi. Another good friend of uh, Tony Spilatro and another sleeper out in Los Angeles, you had Joey Hansen. Him and Nick Calabrese killed Emo Vachi. He was also one of the men, him and Tony Spilatro, that killed Danny Seifert. A very dangerous individual, Chicago outfit associate, and one of uh, Tony Spilatro's go-to guys. Another close friend of Tony Spilatro we all know is Lefty, Lefty Rosenthal. This guy is like the Michael Jordan in bookmaking. He, him, and Chicago Alpha made millions of dollars. 
Tony Spoatro was to keep an eye on him, make sure nobody it takes advantages of or muscles him. They had a fallout because Tony Spoatro was fucking around with his wife, who he was obsessed with. Nobody knew it, but he was actually an informant. And some people thought it was a Chicago outfit and Tony Spoatro. Some people think it was the guys in Kansas City. But one day he went to start his car. The car exploded, and he somehow survived that explosion. This is an actual photo. Just look on the shock look on his face. The car was blown to smithereens. Somehow Lefty survived that. But he was definitely going to get killed. <clears throat> but this was uh, Tony Spilatro's best friend back in the day. Now here, Tony Spilatro was always seen with his lawyer in and out of court. He also was seen with them socially. This is probably the best defense attorney um, in the United States. There's there he is walking out of court with his brother Michael. You got Oscar Goldman. This guy is a real, real character. If it wasn't for Oscar Goldman, Tony Spilatro probably would still be alive today because he would have went to jail. He was constantly under indictment. This guy, he was kind of like John Gotti. He beat numerous state and federal charges. I don't know how. And some of them were pretty serious charges. But the best attorney character, he actually became mayor of Las Vegas, the great Oscar Goldman. Him and Michael Spilatro were good, clo very close. And he saved Tony Spilatro many times and s saved him from spending many nights in jail. Now, sadly, this was the car, the Lincoln, that the Spilatro brothers were last seen in when they went to the when they went to meet somebody. This car was parked at a hotel parking lot right outside O'Hare, and I think inside the cassette they had like a like a James Bond uh, cassette in there. But this was uh, Tony and Michael Spilatro's car. This was the last car they were seen alive in. And then this was uh, a photo of the work car that was used when they carried the, when they transported the two dead brothers of Slotcher brothers from the house in Bensonville, when they, where they were beat to death. They put them in this car, drove them all the way out to Enos, Indiana, which is not too far from Joy Upa's farm. They had issues. They got a little nervous. They got spooked during the burial. So rather than dig deep, those bodies were never supposed to be found. They dug a very shallow grave and got the hell out of there. The bodies were found. Once those bodies were found, it made national attention and all hell broke loose, especially for Chicago outfit. But those crimes remained unsolved up until 2005. But this was the uh, work car that was used to transport the bodies, and then they torched it. Now, here's the house in Bensonville. The Chicago outfit associate lived here. This was the house that they were lured to. According to Nick Calabrese, Jimmy Marcello picked up John Feccarata, Jimmy LaPetria, and him at a venture parking store. He picked them up in a real fancy van, and he dropped the three of them off at the house in Bensonville. Here's a photo of the inside of that house. Nick Calabrese testified that he got there a little early. Fecarada beelined it right to the bathroom. Calabrese was making a Calabrese was the first one to greet Nick, shaking his hand with a smile, busting his balls making wisecracks about how good he looked. He had a nice tan. He's been out west on vacation, making all this money. Nick was a little nervous. Nick testified that he noticed John Fecarata was in the bathroom a long time. Finally, when Fecarata came out, Nick said Fecarata was white as a ghost. He thought the hit was for him. All of a sudden, Nick Calabrese testified that somebody said, they're here. Now, he said he got tense. He knew exactly what was about to go down. All the men were in gloves. 
Michael Spilatro was the first to walk down the stairs. He was greeted by Nick with a handshake and a smile because Nick knew Michael. They were friends. Nick said after he shook his hand, he immediately grabbed his ankles and like tackled him while Louis the Mooch, Louis Eboli, strangled Michael with a rope. Not a knife, not his bare hands, with a rope. He said Michael went quickly and quietly. He didn't put up a fight. A small 22 caliber gun fell out on that floor. According to Nick, John No Knows the Franzo picked up that gun, unloaded it, and wiped a small spudge of blood right off the wall. One of those walls right by the paneling. Nick Calvary said that the men that were there were John Thakarada, Jimmy LaPetria, Sam Carlisi, Joe Ferriola, Louis Marino. In others, he thought out of the corner of his eye that he saw Rocky and Felice. Tony Spilatro realizes the gig's up. He has to say a prayer. The prayer was denied. And the rest of those men brutally beat and stomped Tony Spilatro to death. Here's a photo of the men that were there. Again, Iupa. He's going away to the can probably for life, most of his life. He was so pissed off and betrayed and disappointed with the Spalatro brothers. He was foaming at the mouth. He said, I want them both knocked down one and two. I don't care how you do it, do it. The order was carried out. The first hit they were going to do out in Vegas. That's right. Jimmy Marcello gave Nick Calabrese and Uzi and two grenades. He took a train all the way out to Nevada. John Thakarada drove out there. Joey Hansen drove out there from California. Paulie Shiro was living out there. Frankie, Shri Frankie the Schweiss drove out there. All the hit team assembled, but they couldn't really get a good tail on Michael and Tony. They couldn't really give them, get both of them together. One day, Nick testified when they were tailing Michael, he was driving around in a brown minivan with Salozzi and Edels and plates. And that was kind of funny, knowing that had to be Michael driving that van, you know, major car dealership like that in Chicago. Frankie, Cal uh, Frankie Schweiss, not Calabrese, Frankie uh, Schweiss suggested that they would hit Tony with an Uzi when he was coming out of the court building because Tony had a court date. But they thought about it. there was no way they would be able to get away with it. There was one road in, one road out, and that would draw a lot of heat. They weren't sure the outfit bosses would like that. So meanwhile, the outfit bosses are getting antsy. They're getting pissed. These guys have been out there for a couple months, spending a lot of money. Nothing's getting done. They knew if they didn't kill the Splatchos, they could have gotten killed. So they switched. They went to plan B. Plan B, as we all know, they had a ruse that Michael Spilatro is going to be a made guy. Tony Spilatro is going to be a bump. Tony Spilatro actually had court while he was in Chicago. He also had some very serious health issues. Obviously, with all the stress of everything he had going on in Vegas, all the hot water he was in with the outfit, and all his court cases coming up, the man was about to have a heart attack. He might have actually been better off going to jail or having a heart attack than when the outfit guys got to him. But again, they got him to the house. Jimmy Marcello allegedly was the man that set up the Spatros. And here's all the heavyweights were there. Joe Ferriola, Rocky and Felice, John Nonos the Franzo, Nicky Calabrese went into great detail. I found him credible for the most part. Louis Marino, John Fecarata, LaPetria, Louis the Mooch, who strangled Michael, Cal uh, Michael Splotcher with the rope, Sam Carlisi, Little Jimmy, and Al Taco. Now, Nick Calabri said there was a couple guys there he didn't recognize, but he never once said that Frank the German was there. I know his brother Frankie Calabrese wanted to be there 
I think he was sick or doing laying low in Florida. And Frank Calabrese was a little nervous why he wasn't part of the hit team. Frank Calabrese was very always very cautious. And then here, when they showed this at the Family Secrets trial on the two monitors, everybody in the courtroom gasped. From the chest up to the head, he was brutally beaten and stomped to death. Black, blue, and purple. You could not even recognize the poor man's face. That's a horrible way to die. They also said there was no drugs in Michael. The autopsy, autopsy, autopsy said no drugs were found in Tony and Michael Spilatro's body, but there was liquor. Now, there have been reports that these guys had drinks that they got them a little loosened up before they took them downstairs and brutally beat them to death. However, Nick Calabrese never said anything about these guys having drinks. We'll never know, but that's two brutal victims of the Chicago outfit. And that crime uh, happened in the mid-1985, 1986, when I was like a senior in high school. Now, another friend of uh, Tony Spilatro, a guy that low, laid pretty low, you had Fat Herbie. This guy was a, an enforcer, a collector, a killer. Whatever Tony Spilatro wanted done out in California, out in Arizona, or even in Chicago, he was his, pretty much his number one man right next to Frankie Collada. When Tony Spilatro was, went missing and he got killed, he knew he lost a lot of his power. And guys from California and Buffalo mob families tried taking over his rat, his some of his gambling rackets, some of his um, sh uh, prostitution shit he had going on. They eventually killed him in Nevada. But uh, if his connections in the Chicago outfit weren't in jail or didn't die, they would have never been able to do that to Fat Fat Herbie. But Fat Herbie ended up getting killed, and uh, not sure if uh, the guys that killed him were ever held responsible. And then not too long ago, some pretty interesting news. A lot of barrels are, they're finding being washed ashore in Lake Mead. And some of these barrels have actually um, remains of people that were killed. Uh, obviously, um, some of those are victims of the Chicago outfit. And they're investigating some of that right now. As we all know, there's a lot of holes in that desert. And I'm sure Tony Spilatro, the Hole in the Wall gang, and the Chicago Outfit have a lot of uh, victims here. Guys that got behind in payments, guys that were killed because they were going to flip or cooperate, personal vendettas. But there's a lot of victims in the Chicago Outfit in the desert. Uh, over a thousand unsolved murders in the Chicago Outfit. If you like my Chicago mob trial stories, hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends. You know, that's a pretty horrible way to die. What happened to Michael and Tony Spilatro? But Tony Spilatro, you know, he was no Boy Scout. He was no angel. You live by the sword. You die by the sword. But if it wasn't for his lawyer, Oscar Goldman, keeping him out of jail, he could be alive today. There's a good chance he'd be locked up or would have died of uh, health issues. Thank you. Everybody have a great, great weekend. Enjoy your Memorial Day. Hit the like button, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thank you.